Hi, my name is Tracy de Carme Espinosa, and this is a video on sleep and dreaming and the influence it has on our ability to learn and to maximize our performance in life. Sleep is fascinating and there's lots of important facts, things that we now know after about 100 good years of excellent research in this field. For example, we know we spend about 25% of sleeping dreaming in a REM state. Right? This was first hinted at back in the 1950s and actually proven more recently thanks to better technology. And basically we go through several cycles, maybe about three, four, five of these cycles every night, which is around a 90 minute cycle. Some people have very short cycles and others have 100 minute cycles, but the average is around 90 minutes. So as we fall into sleep, we go down into deep sleep, then we come up and we have a dream and then we go back down into deep sleep and we dream. And just before we wake up again, we go back down to sleep and then we have extended dreaming time. There are different areas of the brain. The reason we can to distinguish dreaming from sleep is because they actually are different neural mechanisms in the brain and different hubs are, are used as well as a different balance for neurotransmitters. Now it's not fair to say that all dreaming occurs in REM. We know that actually dreaming can occur in just about any state of sleep, but most dreams occur in this REM or rapid eye movement stage of sleep, which is just before you wake up. So while you can have dreaming present in non-REM sleep, it's not as common. As we mentioned before, there are very different chemical and electrical changes that occur in sleep and in dreaming, which are distinct from wakefulness. And a lot of the measurement has been done looking at neuroadrenaline and serotonin and the different changes that they experience from waking to sleep to dreaming stages. We know that dream states are very similar, at least in description, to hallucinations, but also in neural networks that are involved. So somebody in an active dream state actually looks like somebody who's doing a lot of heavy hallucination. And literally, since humans have kept records, we have wondered what is the purpose of sleep. And there are some societies and cultures that look into this much better than we do in the West. But the thought is that we need to sleep to take care of the body. And the general correlation here is that only mammals have thermal regulation and only mammals have REM sleep. So there's this idea that those two things must somehow be related. But we know that sleep isn't just of the body. We know that it serves the brain and the mind. And so consolidation of memory, which is only recently discovered, is a key element of the dreaming phase. So sleep and dreaming are incredibly important for human learning because attention and memory are incredibly important for human learning. And memory is consolidated through the dreaming state and you are able to refresh your body and be able to pay attention after you've slept. Some of you might be interested in this idea of productive sleep or this idea of lucid dreaming. Can you solve problems in your sleep? And there's a lot of very good evidence that yes, you can. Different people can do that. It's mainly based on the premise that sleep is a behavior. And like any behavior, you can get better at it if you just practice it. So this is why the new terminology of sleep hygiene comes into play. How do you take care of yourself so that you sleep better, so that you dream better, so that you can resolve problems in your sleep? So by studying the different characteristics of sleep and dreaming, there have been many theories over the years about what dreams are for. We well, Alan J. Hobson is, is, to me, one of these geniuses in this area who's done nothing but study sleep for 35, 40 years. And he looks at sleep on a continuum of consciousness. He does not think that when you're asleep, you're unconscious. He basically thinks that that's a level of consciousness. And they only vary thanks to the different levels of neurotransmitters and electricity that you can measure. So as we said before, sleep onset, you're in light sleep. This is where you can uh, give yourself that idea to have that productive sleep and solve problems, right? Then you go down and in non-REM sleep, then REM, when your eyes are moving around, you're having your dreams. So you have about four or five of these a night if you sleep the average eight hours. Now we know that it's normal to sleep between four and a half hours and 12 hours. The average might be eight, but the normal curve shows that most people at least aim for those eight hours of sleep. There are, however, people, and this should be taken almost anthropologically speaking, who sleep on a four hour rather than eight hour pattern. Now, What's so interesting is that Hobson's earlier work actually showed that if you were in a sensory deprivation tank, if you didn't have any sound coming from outside, anything like that, and you were told, sleep, eat, uh, work when you want to, and most of us would actually be on a four-hour pattern. What he speculates on is that it's more likely that we have fallen into an eight-hour pattern of sleep because of society norms. Uh, you can't, you know, go off to work for four hours and then oh, sleep for four more hours and then oh, work again for four hours. Basically, we've divided up the day into these eight hours of, of sleep, of work, and of playtime to have this eight, 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 eight division, which is not necessarily what your brain would do on its own. Now, what happens if you don't get a normal amount of sleep? Now, 
what your normal is might not be my normal, okay? So, but the idea is if you say, oh, I'm sleepy, I have not slept my norm, actually high motivational activities can keep you going for a good couple of days. However, nobody functions past three days and most of us will really mess up even after a single day. You begin to have um, crazy intense dreams, you open yourself up to infection. Your body, because you're not sleeping and dreaming, does not know how to internally manage itself as far as thermal regulation is concerned. So pushing yourself, not sleeping your norm for multiple days has dire consequences. And most especially within a school context, you're not really learning. Because if you're not sleeping and dreaming, you're not consolidating the memory, which means you're not really getting the information in your head anyway. So what's the point? I would always tell my kids, sleeping is just as important as studying. So another interesting fact about sleep is that people start to sleep less and less and less as they get older and older and older. During gestation, babies will sleep almost 24 hours a day. And then when you get to be older, you actually sleep a lot less. Now what's so interesting about that though is, remember those people who only sleep four hours a day? I would say that those older people, because they are now retired and don't have to be on anybody else's schedule, are actually going back to what would be their normal cycle of sleep. So last point, big ideas about sleep hygiene. It sounds a little bit funny, right? We know about, um, you know, bathing and hygiene and washing yourself and all the rest of it. Well, what is good sleep hygiene? There are some really important ideas that I hope you get to watch by um, Dr. Herbert in Canada who speaks about the importance of sleep hygiene. It's one of the most highly reported national health disasters that we have. Most people say they don't get enough sleep, but as we said before, sleep is a behavior, so you can learn to do it better. One of the things he points out in the video, you know, don't go to sleep with devices. Your bed is meant for two things and two things only. Limit the technology there. He also suggests limiting substance intake at night. Uh, having a glass of wine at night, it induces a sleep, but then a couple of hours later, you're like totally awake because you did not fall asleep because your body was asking you to, but because you, you have the alcohol in your system. So that was depressing your system, so you go to sleep, but then that means that later on, then you need that cup of coffee to get you back up. So he said, we rely on too many external stimulants to get us asleep and to get us awake, which is actually poor sleep hygiene. Okay, so those are some of the big ideas about sleep. We talked a bit about how sleep occurs. We talked about sleep hygiene. We talked about the importance of sleep and of dreaming. What we did not talk about, which I hope we get to talk about when we're together, is about power napping. Is a good nap as refreshing as a full night's sleep? We'll talk about that when we see each other. Looking forward to it. Thanks.